Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Alex Paul from InvestorStream and I'll be your host today. Joining us is Future Metals Executive Chairman Patrick Walter and Managing Director Jardee Kinnamonth who will be providing an update on the outcomes of the scoping study at the company's 100% owned Panton project in Western Australia. Jardee and Patrick will provide a short presentation on this progress followed by a Q&A session. Please feel free to send in your questions via the chat platform in the question pane in the GoToWebinar control panel, or simply email them to me at alex at investorstream.com.au. You can also download a copy of the presentation by navigating to the handouts pane in the control panel. Finally, a copy of the webinar will also be available on Future Metals website and social media platforms later today. But for now, I would like to throw it over to Patrick to kick things off. Patrick, the floor is yours. Thanks, Alex, and um, a very warm welcome and thank you to everyone for uh, for joining this this, um, this presentation. I uh, really appreciate everyone taking the time out of their days to to listen to the Future Metals story and also receive an update on the uh, on the scoping study. We're pretty excited about um, releasing this study, very much seen as the tip of the iceberg and, and just showing the tip of the iceberg for what um, what the Panton project can be. Um, and we'll, we'll go through some detail now on uh, on the value proposition that entails. So we'll just uh, just go through to the the summary slide, uh, Jardi. Thank you very much. So uh, this is a good summary snapshot of of what has been developed to date. But it really is the culmination of of 20 years of work uh, that's been in place from uh, the Panton assets. So very much a sunk capital play as we see it leverages off. 50 million bucks of investment to date. Uh, technically de-risked asset in terms of work that's been done around mining and also the metallurgical development. The asset also is on granted mining leases as well. Uh, it has um, a, a nearly a half kilometre decline in place and it's had nearly 400 tonnes of metallurgical bulk test work done on it. So uh, as scoping studies go, there wouldn't be a lot of other projects out there that have had this much development put in place before they uh, before a scoping study was released. In addition to that, it's also had 45,000 metres of drilling that occurred on it. So all those uh, lead towards a, a progressively de-risk project uh, and a strong opportunity to grow from what has been released uh, to date as well. You'll see, uh, we'll go through some of the details around um, that development and the opportunity that presents with the scoping study. Uh, but there's also a number of near-term upsides for that in terms of resource growth, uh, delivery of our PFS, and also drilling of our regional targets, which will ultimately present as feed to the asset as well. Um, you see the last door point there around uh, refresh board and management driving the project forward. Uh, the, the, the team and the company has made a strong statement around that, around building a team now of, of mine builders, uh, a group with track record in development of mines um, over the last period of time. And that's really uh, what's going to drive this asset forward as well, is that, is that team that we're starting to build now. Uh, just moving on to the next slide. Thanks, uh, Jardy. This is a good summary slide that creates a snapshot of, uh, of what Panton is now. The business is now focused completely on the high grade component of this deposit. Total resource is, is huge, frankly. It's 93 million tonnes at uh, two gram per tonne palladium equivalent, which is a massive deposit in itself. We are initially focused completely on the high grade component, 37 million tonnes at 3.3 gram per tonne palladium equivalent. And even inside that is our beautiful reef, nearly 11 million tonnes at seven gram palladium equivalent. This is the highest grade PGM asset in Australia. And in terms of undeveloped PGM assets worldwide, one of the highest grade assets there. Affords you a lot of leverage, gives you a lot of opportunity in terms of getting meaningful scale production and also lowering your costs as well. So it's really important to note that grade uh, and the opportunity that it provides Panton and obviously the shareholders as well. The other really important component about this asset is its location. Western Australia, a clear tier one mining jurisdiction here versus the majority of other PGM supplies, so over 85% of PGM supply comes from high sovereign risk jurisdictions. We're talking about South Africa, Russia and Zimbabwe. Now that supply is inconsistent at best, which really sets the PGM market up for a, for a company like Pantom, which can provide 
as I said, meaningful scale production, but also can provide that consistency of supply. So we're not getting the asset taken off us. There's no new massive regime changes, all those sort of things that can come with high risk jurisdictions. So the supply that comes from Western Australia and from Panton is, is attracting a premium in the sense that smelters and downstream users can rely on it and it can be can be delivered to them. We're one kilometre off a sealed highway, uh, we've got regional amenities and we're three hours trucking to a deep water port, uh, which then we can sell this product all around the world. So a good opportunity to supply the market um, with low sovereign risk PGMs. Metallurgy we'll go to in some detail. It's the key to this uh, asset um, in terms of how it's been unlocked and what we're able to do with it. But you'll see there some of the details. This is a conventional, simple crush grind float, float uh, flow sheet, and it generates good solid recoveries at around 90% there and delivering a, a very nice concentrate grade with a nickel credit that can be sold all over the world. Some of the work that's been done by the business to date around producing a chromite product has really been an incremental value add in terms of uh, improving the um, the overall economics of the operation. And we also see a, a huge amount of upside uh, in terms of what we can do with these concentrates, again, improving the economics even further by bringing in metal byproducts. So copper, cobalt, rhodium, iridium are all in this deposit. Right now, we're not satisfied that they are, they've been upgraded enough to be included as payable metals in, in the concentrate but we have reams of opportunity to actually improve that concentrate further and actually then generate them as potential uh, payable byproduct credits. Irrespective of that, we still have an exciting value proposition from the concentrate that we're producing. Um, and as we said, we're already on granted mining leases and we have a whole raft of sunk capital in place, which is really important. Sunk, the concept of sunk capital is really important with regards to Panton and its position in the cost curve and also its position in the market in terms of riding the next price wave. Uh, you'll see that, uh, we can just go to the next slide, uh, Jade, as, as we talk here, but the the ability for Panton to access some capital means that we can develop this asset quickly. So we're not developing a mine right now. Uh, you know, we, we have uh, just shown what it is today, just shown what it can be today and a fraction of that opportunity. And Jada, you can move to the next slide. I'll, I'll talk to that. Uh, so these numbers here in the scoping study are really just the tip of the iceberg and highlight what we plan to grow over the next uh, number of years and to be an operating mine. But the sunk capital component allows us to aggressively develop it. And when you, our target is within say three years, we want this asset to be production ready. Now that versus some of our peers uh, in Australia and around the world, who realistically have great opportunities to develop their asset, but they are going to be 10 to 15 years away from development. Panton is the only asset that will be production ready as the next price upswing occurs. So right now, the PGM, PGM price basket is in the toilet, quite frankly. It is low, uh, and we're talking about my, the price basket being in the 65th percentile of the cost curve. So currently you have 35% of operating mines losing money. Now that is simply not a sustainable, a sustainable scenario. Supply is naturally being taken out and we'll show some slides on this in the, uh, in the near future, but we're seeing supply being taken out of the market at the moment and that will necessitate price increases. Now when, when that occurs, we don't know. Is it six months, 12 months, two years? Not sure but it will happen, it happens. These things go through natural price cycles. That sets Panton up beautifully to be ready. As that price upswing occurs, we can bring this project into development and generate some really good margins and some really good cash flow for shareholders as well. As it stands right now, we've modelled this project on a conservative basket uh, price. It's only slightly above the current price itself. It's still into the cost curve. And even at that conservative modelling, well below the five-year average basket price for PGMs, we're still generating very solid return in terms of its MPV, $250 million pre-tax MPV, generating $91 million in operating cash flow, $72 million in operating free cash flow. Those are good solid numbers. And the other really important thing to highlight here is this study is based on 26% of the high-grade resource only. So as part of our recording, uh, reporting requirements with the ASX, 
we are limited into what we can report versus the quality of the drilling and the, and the development that's been done to date. This study models 50% indicated resource and 50% inferred resource. That equates to a nine year current life of mine, but it's only 26% of our high grade resource, which ultimately, if we're up and running and we're in the second quartile um, in terms of all in sustaining cost, of course this asset continues. That's our opportunity ahead of us. So we'll continue to bring resource into that indicated and, and, and measured classifications that will allow us to continue to bolt on more and more mine life in terms of our modelling, which will ultimately just keep adding on those annual years of free cash flow. You can see 70, $100 million, depending on your on your price tag, which transcends straight into the MPV of the project. So we fully expect to continue to grow the value proposition of this asset by extending that mine life and demonstrating that through the PFS and the DFS that will occur very quickly after it as we get this asset production ready. So I'll stress that this scoping study is the tip of the iceberg and it's showing what Panton can be. But in actual fact, we're really only showing a quarter of what it is right now. Pretty easy to extrapolate um, how we do that, you know, the additional value creation going forward. The other really interesting component of this slide is around the production base. So PGM 3E production of 117,000 ounces per annum. What does that mean? Well, that means that in the Western world, so outside of those high sovereign risk jurisdictions, you're one of the top producers. I'm talking about being potentially being in the top five producers in the Western world. And that is a really important fact here in terms of invest investability for future metals. So we have all of this production in these in these call it risky jurisdictions, and then Panton inside that top five. All the other miners in that top five are diversified miners. So if you want the ability to play the PGM market, whether it's now, six months, 12 months time, two years time, Future Metals really presents the only way as a near-term pure play PGM asset of globally significant scale to invest in the PGM market. So it's really the standout opportunity for investor exposure. And we've only just started to show that. So this is the first presentation where we've been able to show the market, this is the scale and it's gonna be a top five producer in the world. And this is the opportunity in terms of being pure play and the best way to get access to PGM prices. And as we said now, the PGM prices, um, actually we've just moved to the next slide, Jade. PGM prices you'll see here from the, from the next slide, are well into the cost curve. So this is cost curve that represents all producers at the moment. Now that red line there is the current price or the current basket price of PGMs. And you'll see it's at what's known as the 65th percentile. So that means 65% of producers are making money or break even, 35% of producers are losing money. Now no one loses money. You either shut your operation down or you very quickly expect a price rebound to occur here. It's very unusual to have a scenario where you have uh, the price point at the 65th percentile uh, of the of the cost curve there. Supply will get taken out of the market in that fourth quartile. So that fourth quartile is dominated by uh, high cost South African producers of uh, big old aging deep mines. And those producers, you can easily Google it, you'll see the layoffs that are occurring with people in those areas and the supply is being stripped out of the market. That just by pure su supply demand fundamentals will necessitate a springboard back in prices in time. We don't know when that is, but we see that be, we see that occurring. Panton itself is positioned beautifully in the second quartile of the cost curve. So when we're talking about an asset that currently has a life of mine of nine years, but with full knowledge that we see multi-decade potential from the asset, it needs to be able to ride the wave. Sometimes metal prices will be high, sometimes metal prices will be low. We know that Panton will always be producing once it's in production there. It'll be generating good margins in times like these, but it is so highly leveraged to that price movement and that price increase. It'll generate uh, amazing margins as it goes, um, as, uh, as prices start to improve there. Now we conservatively um, estimate a long-term base case pricing in our own study at the 85th percentile of the cost curve. So you know, do we know what the prices will be in five, 10 and 20 years? No, we have no idea. We, we really don't know how to predict that. 
and no one really does. There's so, so many factors that go into that. But by modelling a study that assumes that 15% of producers will be losing money is a very conservative and a tight way of saying that you have modelled this on a balanced market. And so we know that if we model it at that, rail, at that rate, it's a real number. It's not made up, not imaginary. It's a realistic number for a long-term base case price for the PGM basket there. And even under that price scenario, which is well below the five-year average, the business is still generating good margins. And it's really all about that OPEX, all about that all-in sustaining cost, which really is because of the high grade. That high grade allows us to produce a material amount of production at a low cost base. We obviously generate some good returns well from our chromite product, uh, but it ultimately puts us right down that protected end of the cost curve, no matter what those prices do going forward. We'll just flick on to the, uh, the next slide there, Jade. Um, we'll just talk about uh, a bit about the fundamentals in there. So the key to Panton is all about the metallurgy and how that's been developed. The beauty of it is over the last 20 years, the metallurgy has been de-risked and simplified into a really standard flow sheet. We're talking about mine, crush, grind, float, produce a high grade concentrate and sell it. Get it out the door and sell it. So there's no downstream uh, hydrometallurgical process here. There's no big capex item, highly technical item here. This is a pretty stock standard flow sheet that allows production of a high grade concentrate and allows export of that all over the world. Uh, and that's really what's unlocked the value of this project. Many years ago, this asset was being looked at with a big downstream met flow sheet, uh, big capex and that sort of thing. That's all changed now. It has been simplified and allows this operation to be moved on and developed quickly over the next few years as we as we go through that um, feasibility mode. And then that also allows us to time our entry into the market in terms of when we want to apply the capital and when we want to develop the asset with the next price increase that is coming uh, as a result of uh, supply being stripped out of the market as well. Uh, I'll now uh, pass over to Jardy, who can talk in a little bit more detail about that unlocking and that value creation that has occurred really from the last two or three years of, of Future Metals uh, life, uh, life of the asset. Yeah, thank you, Pat. Um, as Pat says, really the, the focus of the company over the past 24 months has really been the flow sheet um, and, and really looking at how we pull as much value out of the ore that we mine out of the ground as possible, but also using that flow sheet to ensure that we can mine that ore body as productively as possible. And the real linchpin and, and foundation for the scoping study and the flow sheet and the economics that you're seeing is really the, the ability to produce a high grade saleable concentrate from that ore feed. Um, fortunately, we acquired the recipe or the flotation regime to do that um, as part of the acquisition of the asset back in, in 2021. Um, and we've built upon that, that flotation regime to establish repeatability, reduce the cost of doing um, that flotation regime. Uh, and, and what that's allowed is really, a, you know, again, a concentrate grade that is very high and can carry the logistics cost, the smelting charges and still generate a substantial uh, return for uh, investment. What we've also looked at is, it, well, we've had a multi-pronged approach in terms of how we've unlocked the asset on top of that. Um, we've applied that flotation regime to the high grade dunite that sits next to the reef. So previously, um, all the flotation work was on the reef. We've established that we can produce or we can upgrade that high grade dunite very effectively, which really blows the mining wide open. So it allows us to access a lot more uh, material underground and really look at an upsized operation uh, that, that, we're kind of, that we're currently showing within the scoping study. That's further complemented by the ore sorting work. So we've done bulk ore sorting work on material representative of a stoke um, within the mine or an, an underground block in the mine. Um, and what that allows us to do is, is really focus on development productivity, mining productivity, and also ore recovery within the mine, and then worry about dilution later up above surface where we can split out the, uh, we can split out the, um, the reef and the high grade dunite from each other. The other string to our bow here has been the tailings leaching. 
Um, and really what that does is ensures that overall recovery is improved and it provides a safety net for the flow sheet. So if there's any quarters or months or periods where flotation underperforms and we, we, we lose more uh, metal than, than we uh, anticipate, the tailings leaching is that safety net to capture that metal before that, um, that metal goes into the tailing. So that really improves the robustness of the flow sheet. And then the last, the last um, string in our bow has really been the chromite concentrate. So recently when we released the updated MRE, we incorporated a chromite concentrate, uh, a chromite grade estimate in there. And that was on the back of um, us demonstrating that we can produce a, um, a very valuable co-product in the saleable, uh, in a saleable chromite con um, from the, the PGM flotation tailings, which is, you know, adds a adds a significant boon to the economics of the project. And it's worth noting here that that is something that is commonly done in South Africa uh, with opera, PGM operations there as well. Um, speaking of South Africa, this deposit, um, as a quick overview, is a reef style, PGM reef style deposit, very similar to, to what they're mining and processing in South Africa. Um, as Pat said before, the, the, the focus of the study is really that 37 million tonnes of reef and high-grade dunite. Uh, and again, the study only um, envisages tapping into 26% of that, so plenty of mine life uh, and expansion upside within that. But the further expansion upside also comes from the bulk dunite that sits around both the reef and high-grade dunite. Uh, there's 50 million tonnes of, of material there that the study doesn't even look at, right? So what that what you know that allows us to think about is is expansion scenarios down the line or presenting an expansion scenario to potential large strategic partners um, to, to demonstrate that this is a, you know over and above what we've demonstrated in the scoping study, an asset of, of very material scale. The mining will run through this quite quite quickly, but it is a, an initial open open pit mine um, for the first two years. Uh, you know, the first year we'll be establishing and constructing the, the processing plant. Uh, towards the end of year one, we'll be putting the underground portals in, and then it'll be a really conventional um, underground mining method, long hole open stoping. Um, we've got plenty of, of fantastic and world class WA. Um, mining contractors that are very effective at this style of, of mining um, and, and that's how we'll, we'll, we'll um, look to extract the ore body. Again, ore sorting is a, is a key um, component of our mining strategy. It allows us to really develop through that ore body really quickly um, and, and again recover as much ore as possible and then we can basically split out the, um, the ore streams up at surface uh, using that ore sorting. But our mandate, you know, on the back of this scoping study, um, what, what Pat and I are, are really going to aggressively pursue from here on in is making sure that this project is as production ready as possible for that ne next upswing in PGM prices. It is in a massive trough at the moment. Pat's already um, gone through it at, at length in terms of 35% you know, of producers are, are currently underwater. That's basically over half of the South African um, PGM market. Uh, so that suggests to us that that, that, that PGM price upswing is probably not far away. And, and further to, to, um, to well, to, to re-establish Pat's earlier points, um, we are really, I think, the only game in town for tapping into that, that upswing um, in PGM prices in the near term. You know, this is a brownfields asset. We're sitting on granted mining leases. There's previously been a bankable fees feasibility study put around the project. There's previously been environmental assessments, heritage surveys, everything that you need without any red flags popping up to say that we can get this asset um, to production in, in quite, a, you know, quite a compressed time frame, especially relative to any other Western world development projects out there. In terms of upside to um, to the to the scoping study, um, there, there's plenty. Um, I think the easiest one to to really think about is again that that the fact that we've only envisaged using 26% of the high high grade dunite and reef in that mine plan. Um, and to give you an you know a, a bit of an estimation of 
what an additional year of mine life is worth to the project on an undiscounted basis, you know, the average cash flow per annum um, after CapEx, after tax is $72 million or $100 million on the, the five-year average price case. So you don't have to use too much imagination to see what three, four, five years of additional mine life will add to total project value. Um, and then there's also the potential to, to grow the deposit at depth with one of our best holes being uh, PS414, which, which achieved uh, you know, our, 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 um, one of our higher grades and thickest widths. Um, so plenty of upside at depth there as well to grow that overall deposit. And the other aspect to, to future metals and, and our growth plan and um, value additions to the company and the project overall is really our regional exploration package. So we've recently acquired the Osprey, uh, well, we recent, recently acquired a company called Osprey, which, which owned a, a significant tenement package uh, surrounding uh, or proximate to Panton um, in what is a highly prospective corridor for making nickel copper PGM discoveries. And fortunately, we've already had one of those discoveries made for us. And that was the real uh, real reason that we acquired Osprey was for, to acquire the Eileen Bohr prospect. So this is a really uh, promising advanced exploration target. It's already been proven to have mineralization across a 300 meter strike extent. Um, the intercepts that, that, that were that the, the, the uh, historical drilling has, has gotten previously were 100 to 120 metres, 0.7% copper, 0.3% nickel and one gram per tonne uh, PGMs, and that's from surface. So that's, that's very economic mineralisation uh, and it's open at depth as well. Um, so we're also putting a geological and geophysical model around that Eileen Bohr prospect and the broader Eileen Bohr project. And we're already really excited for what we're seeing in terms of um, other potential proximate targets and extensions uh, along strike and at depth. Um, but what we'll look to do really in the near term is go out there uh, as soon as the wet season ends and start infill drilling that to establish a resource, uh, putting a few metallurgical holes through it to establish the metallurgy, and then, uh, and then also look to drill those step out targets as well. And you know, it, it to us, you know, it could be two, five, 10, 50 million ton um, project. Any which way you cut it, it's going to add value to the overall Panton, you know, our, our overall Panton project, because this scoping study shows that this is already a project worth uh, establishing just on the existing resource base that we have. I'll throw Thanks, back to Pat. Yeah, thanks, Charlie. So uh, this is a good summary slide that that speaks for itself. But you know, to really summarise these points, you have a fantastic amount of sunk capital here relative to the market cap of the company. I mean, the cap, market cap of the company is very small; it's very cheap, twenty million odd dollars, fifty million dollars worth of expenditure on this asset to date. Hard assets: you have forty-five thousand metres of drilling and decline mining leases in place. We fully intend to leverage that sunk capital, to bring this project through the feasibility process, which is a very standard process that we've done before, and demonstrate the full breadth of the value proposition. As we do that, we expect to see a turnaround in the macro occurring as well, and generating really good value in terms of share price appreciation, and our ability then to ultimately fund the development of the asset. No one's no one's um, funding the asset today, the capex of this asset today. We've got a long way to go, a lot of story to tell, just at the tip of the iceberg um, at the moment. Uh, we see those huge upsides in terms of resource growth and regional discoveries, and also the inclusion of other payable metals. And also the, the company is evolving, it's forward, it's management evolving. We're putting together a team of mine builders, and that's exactly what we plan to do here. We're gonna utilize the next price upswing, and we're going to build a mine here, and it will be one of the largest PGM mines in the Western world. Um, which will generate really strong returns ultimately for shareholders. Um, I'll, we'll just finish there, Alex. Thank you very much for everyone, and um, I believe we'll, we'll open up to a few questions. Uh, it'd be great to uh, chat through those. Thanks, Alex. Thanks, Alex.
<laughs> thanks, Patrick. Thanks, Jardine. Yes, we've had a couple of questions come through and um, really appreciate you all uh, submitting them. Uh, keep submitting them through uh, using the questions pane in the GoToWebinar control panel. Patrick, obviously it's great to see the scoping study and the potential, uh, but it does appear the market has reacted to CapEx figures. Can you just explain how much of these costs are you anticipating will be subsidised by the Australian government or JVs and strategic partners? Uh, thanks, Alex. Yeah, look, excellent question um, that's come through there. Now, the CapEx figure itself of uh, circa $250 million obviously is a number. It's a decent number to, uh, to deal with. We are nowhere near financing that at the moment. We still have to go through the motions over the next couple of years before we're even considering that amount. Uh, in terms of mining investments, it's, it's relatively modest. You know, we're, we're building a 1.25 million tonne per annum flotation plant, so there's lots of comps about that being the approximate cost of, of developing a, um, a relatively simple um, flow sheet as this one is in terms of mining standard there. But absolutely, along the journey over the next few years, we are going to be looking at all sorts of ways to minimise dilution to existing shareholders. I mean, that is, that is a core part of our, of, our, uh, of our MO. We have to look at these ways. So whether it's tapping into, for example, the Northern Australian Infrastructure Fund, the NAIF, uh, uh, for this sort of development, it's right in their wheelhouse being strategic metals and in Northern Australia, um, looking at other low cost ways of doing it, JVs, strategic partners, absolutely. Of course, we're gonna look at that stuff over time but we need to get the studies out to demonstrate to those potential JV partners of what this could be, and we need to continue to evolve and grow those studies. So much like investors starting here at this low base, uh, we take along any of those potential JV partners along for the journey. Now, um, you know, they may come through, they may not, but it's an, clearly an opportunity we have, particularly with the resource expansion with the large bulk material that Panton has. It is obviously an opportunity um, uh, for jo uh, for joint vet partners going forward, and especially when you consider that the majority of other PGM assets are in those higher risk jurisdictions. Having some Aussie production is always going to be a benefit um, to other uh, to other existing producers. So we'll see how that plays out going forward as well. Even just the process of actually bringing this scoping study out starting to be able to market the, the story and actually put numbers over the asset for the first time in 20 years. We'll be able to utilise this as the basis for generating hopefully share price improvements, certainly getting more and more investors involved in the company and bringing the market cap and the share price up on the stock as well. So I, uh, I, I do agree that market has certainly reacted to CapEx figures, but no one is no one's funding the CapEx anytime soon. We have a whole heap of story to tell and a whole heap of development to go forward, and also a number of ways to minimise that ultimate dilution, um, you know, on uh, on existing shareholders. Thanks, Patrick. You you mentioned the possibility of, of JVs. Uh, have you had much interest uh, from any potential JVs or strategists already? Uh, obviously, that sort of uh, that sort of commentary remains confidential. However, you, you've clearly got a market which is not receptive to joint ventures. You know, the likely joint venture partners, as it stands right now, have got assets which are underwater, if you know what I mean, in terms of the prices. So now is not the time for our business to be going around looking for joint venture partners. As a $20 million market cap company, our best solution is to grow the market cap of the business. And then as we've developed it, as we've de-risked the project further, then you bring in those joint venture partners. Otherwise, we end up the shareholders eventually get diluted out completely by that JV partner. So we've really got to increase the value of this project, increase its exposure in the market, generate competition from those potential JV partners, uh, and then we can start to look at, at bringing them into the fold. Um, but as I said, we're, we're really only at the tip of the iceberg in terms of the project's development, um, as we've just released a scoping study and going into the PFS and DFS, but also marketing the project, telling the market and investors, potential joint venture partners, what it can be. This is the first set of numbers that anyone has been able to see on this project uh, really in 20 years. So you mentioned the market cap there as well, uh, Patrick. What can be done to get the market cap up to a more reasonable 
market capitalization so that I guess you're not giving it away to institutions to strategic or strategists or funding I mean are there some um, some levers that you can well, not levers you can pull but is there something that you can look at to you know get the market up market cap up to a more reasonable capitalization mm, yeah no look perfectly valid question and and, uh, and a good one to discuss through there are a number of levers for this business to to uh, increase its market cap the first one that the company has already made, and they made this standpoint around building on the team, putting together a competent team of mind builders that can actually show this asset will ultimately get into development. So being able to give the market confidence over the next period of time by continually chiseling away the development, that this is an asset that will ultimately consummate its value proposition. Now, the value proposition has only just been released, and it's only a very small portion of the overall value proposition. So part of uh, improving the market cap of the company is going to be building on that. So continuing to hit our goals, delivering on the PFS, delivering on the drilling at Eileen Bore as well, and showing that, that there's a really good product, a really good opportunity in this area to develop a um, one of the top tier of PGM assets in the world. So a lot of the work that's been done today by Jardy and the team that's been in place has more or less fallen on deaf ears, and it just hasn't been able to be talked about, A, because there was wasn't a scoping study yet out to understand what these developments do in terms of adding to the value proposition. And the team has been very, very small to date. Even now, it's still quite a small team, very lean operation that's being run. But we've now got more boots on the ground and we're really able to start to talk to the investment community and give investors that understanding and exposure on the value proposition. And so particularly around uh, educating the market on the fact that Panton is the only near-term pure play development asset in the PGM space of any substance. So we know it's going to be a top producer in the Western world. So institutions, family offices, and, and all sorts of other members of the investment community, at some stage, will have a theory about PGMs. They'll look at the macro, they'll look at the market, and they'll say, PGMs are going to the moon. They're going to go up. The prices are going to rise. How do I make a concentrated bet on my own investment theory? Future Metals is the only way to play that in terms of it's non-diversified, it's pure play, and it's one of the top producers, and it's in an investable jurisdiction. And now that's a concept that we need to continue to get out there, and we can finally start to do that now that we've given the market a taste for what the numbers are. It's a small section of the ultimate value proposition, but we can really start to tell the market about that going forward. Thanks, Patrick. So what's your view on uh, the palladium prices? Uh, it's more than halved over the last year or so. I guess in your view, what are the factors that could precipitate a bounce back? Excellent question. Uh, you know, I wish I, I wish I knew them all exactly. Uh, otherwise, I'd be in the, it would be in a different game. But no, both platinum and palladium prices uh, have come off, particularly palladium. Um, and a lot of that uh, has been probably financial engineering. So palladium has currently, uh, I think, the largest net short position of any of the metals uh, at the moment. So investors are have been betting on a palladium price drop and kind of making it drop. Now, ultimately, those financial instruments have to be unwound, which will, will help it bounce back. But we do see two components. You've got supply and demand, obviously. Now, the supply story has been well told. We know that supply is going to come out of the market because the prices are just simply too low. It's not sustainable. Demand is an interesting concept in both the platinum and palladium space, and it's really driven by a number of different factors. If we think about platinum to start off with, platinum is a big part of the green hydrogen revolution, which is underway at the moment, and also fuel cell electric vehicles, which use in the vicinity of eight times more platinum. So a fuel cell EV uses around eight times more platinum than a conventional internal combustion engine vehicle there. So as the demand for fuel cell EVs continue to grow, we'll see platinum being utilised and in a far greater quantity uh, than what they've been used inside conventional uh, ice vehicles there. Palladium is a similar story as well. It's all about hybrid EVs. So see, we see a, a transition occurring where battery EVs are a big focus, but hybrid EVs are also growing at a stronger rate. In fact, they're growing at a faster rate than battery EVs, albeit off a much lower base there. 
hybrid EVs use around 15% more palladium than a conventional internal combustion engine vehicle as well. So we have two quite good strong demand drivers for both platinum and also palladium going into the future. And that against a backdrop, which is really um, unconvincing supply, let's call it. You have supply, 85% of supply comes from high sovereign risk jurisdiction um, regions. Now, that can turn off at any time. We don't know, uh, but ultimately those are, that is not consistent supply. So when we think about uh, future metals and the Panton project getting up and running and being globally significant supply in a tier one jurisdiction, of course it's gonna be high de in high demand because smelters, the downstream users are gonna want that lower risk supply going into their operations. Thanks, Patrick. So is there any value in the lower grade mineralization which is not being contemplated in the scoping study? Um, well, absolutely, there's value in it, um, but that journey hasn't even really been started to be unlocked. So we have this amazing ore body, this beautiful high grade core, 37 million tonnes at 3.3 gram palladium equivalents. It was at highest grade in Australia by a margin and also one of the highest grade undeveloped deposits uh, in the world. So that sits inside 93 million tonnes of the broader lower grade material. So when you think about this thing, we mine this at one to 1.2 million tonnes per annum, and we have 37 million tonnes of high grade material. There currently isn't a need from, you know, from terms of value creation for shareholders today of a $20 million market cap base. There's no need to start thinking about the broader um, the bulk scale opportunity there. We get this up and running as a second quartile producer focused on the high grade. We keep it simple and we do it right. Of course, there's upside there in the bulk material. Maybe that presents as upside for joint venture partners in the future or anything like that. It's a way of doubling or tripling the production rate with a big capital injection or something like that. But that's realistically, you know, at least five years after you even start production, it's probably 10, 15 years before something like that would happen. Um, but you don't need it to happen because you're already a top five producer in the second quartile from that beautiful high grade component. But, um, you know, just rounding it back and answering the question, absolutely that presents as, a, as value and it's, and it's certainly upside. I'd rather have it than not have it, that's for sure. Thanks, Patrick. We have a couple more questions to, to finish off and then these next two are a bit more macro. Um, how does the project compare to other development stage PGM projects in your, in your view? Uh, there's a good slide on this, Jada, if you don't mind just going going back to it. Um, uh, uh, just a few slides up, I'll, I'll talk to it. Panton is a wonderful development opportunity in the sense that it presents a different opportunity for investors. So we know everyone would probably know Chalice Mining, uh, Generation Mining to a degree in Canada, really fantastic projects big projects, interesting. They've generated a lot of investor interest over the journey as well, but they are a completely different style of investment um, for investors, whether they're retail um, or high net worth or, or institutional based investing. So those assets are multiple years away, and don't know exactly, but it's called 10, 15 years away realistically. Huge capex, uh, quite big, broad uh, metallurgical flow sheets, but big stories, wonderful, great. Panton is really the antithesis to that. Panton presents as a near term, low capital intensity, simple metallurgical flow sheet, high quality product from a tier one jurisdiction that we can bring straight into the market. So Panton is the here and now. It's the one that will uh, be developed as part of the next price uplift in the cycle. The other assets are great. I'm you know, sure they'll come on in due course. They're, they're big development projects but Panton is the one that's actually going to get into production first and it's going to enjoy the spoils of doing that in a, in a world where supply has just been stripped out of the market. Thanks, Patrick. So uh, about the reef itself, how does it compare to other world-class structures like, say, the UG2 and the Morensky in the bushveld in, in South Africa? I'm going to, uh, uh, not that I don't want to answer, but I'll, I'll handball it to Jada. He can, uh, he can have a go at answering this one. 
Yeah, it's it's entirely similar to the bushveld system over in South Africa. Um, the bushveld is a, a geological freak of a, a, a system. Um, it's it's sustaining you know almost uh, you know seventy percent of the, the whole PGM industry essentially. Um, so it's a it's a giant it's one giant reef um, within one giant intrusion. Um, how pantonic uh compares to it is that it's a it's a miniature version of that up in up in the east kimberley and wa um i think the the reef uh at panton compares uh more to the the ug2 um in south africa so it's a it's a chromite rich reef very pgm dominant um but it also has its own characteristics it's actually quite nickel rich relative to the marinsky or ug2 um, so there's also the Platt Reef in South Africa, which is which is quite base metals rich as well. So all of these reef systems obviously have their own unique um, characteristics. I think you know one thing to to add here, and and one thing that the company is doing at a kind of technical de-risking or unlocking level, is um, is looking further up or looking within the existing drill set and doing some really cheap exploration within the existing drill core. To see whether there's there's potentially other styles of reef or other chromite reefs further up um, the stratigraphy than where um, you know the, the the deposit has currently been modelled. So we've got some evidence um, in that existing drilling of some more sulphide rich reefs, which compare um, much more to the Marensky, uh, which sits above the UG2. So we think there's potential um to to you know look, find zones of mineralization um outside of that existing deposit that are that are similarly um still a reef style of of mineralization thanks thanks jardy uh, a couple more questions to to finish um, how do you plan to fund the P P the pfs uh, yep, uh, another excellent question. So obviously as part of the development train, we'll, we'll be assessing options now that we have the scoping study to raise further capital for that. We obviously do that in a measured and managed way um, so that we can raise sufficient funds to develop this and also do the drilling at Eileen Bore, again, bring the project more into the fore and, and, uh, and deliver on that upside. And ultimately that'll be done in a way that re rewards existing shareholders. They've been the supporters of the stock and they'll get the chance to be rewarded. It's at a low price at the moment. We all know that. Um, I look forward to being a shareholder as part of one of those processes as well. Um, and we um, and we'll use that to really drive the uh, drive uh, shareholder value forward, and obviously promote the stock even more as a as a fully funded project, delivering a PFS and delivering some really exciting drilling news flow over 2024. Uh, it'll be a great opportunity for the business. Um, over the course of that, uh, of, over the course of that twelve-month target period to deliver that PFS. Thanks, Patrick and Jardy. I'll leave this uh, final question through to you. Um, so you've obviously delivered the scoping study to finish off the year. Looking forward, what does twenty twenty four look like from an operational point of view? Yeah, I think to to further Pat's point, it's a hugely exciting. Um, year that we have coming ahead. I mean, the, the scoping study is the, the platform for that. Um, Pat's appointment is going to amplify that. We're going to get out there and make sure that, um, you know, everyone across Australia, UK and, and the US knows about Panton and how significant that PGM production is. So um, we see that as a significant value driver, just getting eyes on the company and on the project. Um, uh, for the first time, well, particularly because these numbers are coming out on the project for the first time in 20 years. Um, from an operational point of view, uh, really it's in the near term, the exploration at Eileen Bore and potentially the, the exploration at Panton itself. So looking at um, putting a resource uh, around Eileen Bore, establishing the metallurgy and drilling those step out holes to, to see if there's a a bigger beast at depth that this is that Eileen Bore is just a smaller representation of. Um, so that's the near term focus. Get out there and get ready um, for for uh, for the start of the dry season. Um, and then parallel to that, it's really um, going through a systematic de-risking of each of the elements that make up the scoping study to underpin that pre-feasibility study. 
and and really you know take it through to that next level of of um of you know again de-risking and and really pulling value levers as part of that as well so potentially growing the mine life by upgrading the resource uh potentially improving recoveries as we go through optimization and variability testing potentially improving concentrate grades um going through the same and also optimizing that mining rate potentially looking at cost optimizations there as well uh and then also the 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 permitting piece so doing some environmental surveys that will really underpin any submissions to um state and federal regulators for for positioning the project um again as the most production ready um pgm project outside of, of russia and south africa to to capitalize on that impending um price recovery Fantastic. Well, look, that's all the time we have today. Uh, thank you all for joining me. And I'd also like to thank Jardy and Patrick for presenting and taking the time to answer some questions. As I mentioned before, a recording of the webinar will be on Future Metals website and social media platforms later today. Patrick, before I let you go, do you have any final comments to leave with us today? Oh, Alex, look, just a big thanks to all shareholders um, for listening to this uh, and for the support of the stock. I think very much seen as the tip of the iceberg now that we're starting to show um, and we should have some really exciting developments going forward here not just in, technically on, on the site but we can sort of start to see it unfold in the macro too so it's very much a watch this space and uh, thank you again for all your support it's really appreciated thanks patrick jd anything to add before we go no, I I, uh, I echo echo Pat's comments and sentiment. Um, yeah, again, really excited to crack on with 2024 and um, and and deliver, you know, what I think will be massive shareholder value from from this very low base.